Thanks very much for coming uh, and thanks for your interest in this topic. Uh, so I'm I'm Tom, Tom Dunkley Jones. I'm an associate professor, this new American technology uh, terminology that's come over to the UK. Uh, so otherwise known as senior lecturer in um, paleoclimates and micropaleontology. So my main background is in studying coccolith for algae is single cell phytoplankton that live uh, in the surface of the oceans uh, and form calcium carbonate uh, uh, platelets, which um, when they die form a carbonate uh, sediments in the oceans, but also form the chalk. So uh, that's, my, that's my bag is studying uh, coccoliths, but also using them to try and recreate climates. I've worked a lot with climate modelers, uh, basically looking at proxy data for past climates and comparing those uh, data uh, to model simulations of past climates. So my talk today, I'm going to focus on, in the abstract, as I said, sort of Cenozoic climate. That's a bit of a cheat. I'm really going to focus on uh, paleogene climates and even more specifically, mostly on Eocene uh, climate. Um, and from an Eocene climate perspective, I like to just now we hear a lot about uh, modern day um, climate change and uh, climate warming. Uh, it's obviously like a massive challenge to our uh, societies, how we kind of manage the rates of change that we're going to see and uh, what impacts that has on human societies. But when I'm talking and often talking to uh, people in the general public or in school groups, I just try and flip that question a little bit, um, just to give people perspective that the Earth's climate has actually been in a very different climate state um, for quite a large part of its geologically recent history. So through much of the Mesozoic and early parts of the Cenozoic, it, we were actually in a very warm uh, climate state. So I kind of ask the question of how did we get so cold? And you can, uh, that's demonstrated by this picture. This is one of Jane Francis's uh, project pictures, reconstructions of uh, Antarctica back in the Cretaceous. And you can see it's um, got lots of kind of quite lush vegetation, shrubs and trees. And even there's a little dinosaur, I believe, running around somewhere in the undergrowth of that picture. Uh, through to Antarctica today, which is large parts of it covered by uh, one, two or three kilometers of thick ice sheets um, and a very different uh, biota existing on the Antarctic uh, continent today. And Antarctica hasn't really changed its uh, Paleo position hasn't really uh, shifted that far um, from where we find it today in, on the on the South Pole. So something's going on in terms of climate. Our, our global climate change, global climate has changed uh, over the last hundred million years. But also, we are concerned about our future and the coming uh, decades to the coming centuries, and perhaps even coming uh, millennia. So in terms of our climate, we're really concerned about uh, greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is predicted levels of, of CO2. Uh, this is from the last IPCC report, the AR5 report in 2013. You'll find similar plots in the AR6 report, which came out uh, last year. And you can see this is uh, the black star is where we are uh, now. So we're already significantly elevated CO2 concentrations relative to pre-industrial levels of about 280 parts per million. Uh, I think the latest, when I last checked, were about 418 parts per million. And you can see these various scenarios of emissions, some of them uh, with the sort of business as usual burning fossil fuels, going way up over into the high hundreds or even thousands of parts per million CO2. And then some of these other scenarios, you know, very strong uh, admissions cut, emissions cuts uh, bringing CO2 down after a relatively small peak relative to, to where we are at now. And that CO2 change, those greenhouse gases are predicted to cause changes in surface air temperature of the planet. Uh, and they span a range of predictions, you know, up to kind of eight degrees in this high emission scenario, down to um, hopefully maybe under sort of one and a half or, or as much under two degrees as, as possible in these strong uh, emissions reduction uh, scenarios. But as a paleoclimate scientist, 
I really want to know uh, what do these kind of worlds look like in the past? What does a 400 parts per million CO2 world look like? And in this talk, really, you know, what does a world look like uh, where CO2 is over a thousand parts per million? And that's kind of going back to these Eocene uh, times. So just a brief couple of slides on that. how do we study uh, past climates? How do we get information about uh, climate change? Obviously, we can look at the instrumental record of um, that's been written down. It's actually been um, where uh, temperatures have been taken or rainfall gauges have been taken and written down. And we go back and check those archives. So we have a historical record spanning uh, several centuries back. Then we can look at things like tree ring records that take us back uh, into the centuries or maybe even a, a few thousand years. But beyond that, our best climate archives come from ice cores. So these are uh, cores into these big ice sheets on Antarctica or on Greenland. We can drill down, recover the ice. And within that ice, there are basically gas bubbles that represent the ancient atmosphere. Uh, when that uh, snow fell on the on the, the ice sheets and turned to ice and trapped uh, those gases. So we can analyze those gases and they represent ancient uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 concentrations and also you can look at things like methane, another important greenhouse gas. And we get these beautiful records of things like CO2 change, methane change, actually temperature change. You can look at the, the composition of the water in that ice as well and get estimates of temperature. Uh, on these, these, these uh, polar regions. And what we see when we look at those records, you know, probably many of you are very familiar with these uh, types of plots. So this is going back thousands of years into the past. So we've got uh, for back to 800,000 years on the left-hand side, uh, going working towards the modern on the right-hand side. And we see regular variations in CO2. So we start off with the sort of pre-industrial levels of around 280 parts per million. We go down to about 180 and then we see these regular sawtooth patterns going back uh, through time. And what's really nice about these records, they show that temperature correlates very strongly with CO2 levels. So we see warm uh, climate states correlating with high CO2 levels and colder climates uh, with uh, relatively low CO2 uh, levels. The methane is a bit more complicated, but again, there's a somewhat broad correlation between uh, these uh, CO2 and temperature changes and methane. We call the cold climates, these are glacial times, so they're shaded in blue here, and the warm periods are the interglacials. So this is stage 5e, the last sort of significant uh, interglacial time about 130,000 uh, years ago. So we see these regular patterns of glacial interglacial climates. But just to plot, this is actually not updated, I should have updated it. Uh, so now we're up, I think I said about 418 parts per million a few weeks ago when I last checked it. Um, but you can see we're way higher than any of this record's uh, CO2 levels um, due to the burning of, of, of um, uh, fossil fuels. So we've really increased CO2 dramatically in the, the past uh, couple of centuries, but really uh, CO2 has been really ramping up in the last few decades. So we need to look uh, further back in time and there are some, uh, the ice core records get a, a bit scrappy. You can get back to about a million years. There are some isolated sections of what we call blue ice that go back further than that, maybe back to two or three million years old, but they're not in a kind of stratigraphic continuity. So to go back further in time, we need to go out into the oceans. And this is mostly research that's built on what was started off as the deep sea drilling project then became the Ocean Drilling Project, then the International Ocean Drilling, uh, or Integrated Ocean Drilling Project, and then the International Ocean Discovery Project Program, as it is now, I always get those last two mixed up. But basically uh, efforts to uh, combine international research funding to go out and drill uh, into the oceans for reasons of uh, looking at climate change, but also tectonics, uh, uh, mantle, plate dynamics, interest now even more in deep biosphere communities, so microbial communities living in uh, deep in the sedimentary uh, system as well. So all sorts of uh, science that's done uh, through this International Ocean Discovery Program. But I'm really interested in climate change. So I've been involved in a couple of expeditions 
um, I've led a proposal for one of these expeditions, which is um, was due to drill off uh, Brazil uh, in 2020, but got um, postponed due to uh, COVID and permitting issues. But we're hoping we might be able to go back in to offshore Brazil in a couple of years time, again, to look at Eocene uh, and Cretaceous sediments off Brazil. But this is me in the, on the ship uh, a few years ago off Northwest Australia uh, and into the West Pacific. So the ship is amazing drilling capabilities, getting these continuous uh, sediment cores from the deep ocean. And just like those ice cores, they record the history of climate change. So on the right hand side here is a lovely uh, strung together image of many, many of these cores. So they're about 10 meters long. So about this goes back about 500 uh, meters. So 50 plus uh, cores start to get together, giving you this lovely uh, picture, visual picture of how the sediments have changed. And these cores span about 10 million years. So they go back to the sort of late Miocene. And actually the dark light stripes probably represent the intensity of the Australian monsoon. So in darker times, you have a stronger monsoon system and more sediment delivered uh, to this uh, marginal site just off Northwest Australia. And in uh, times of weaker monsoon, we have more um, uh, carbonate production, so uh, pelagic uh, calcium carbonate being produced by phytoplankton and planktonic organisms out in the ocean, they dominate and we get a lighter uh, colour to the sediment core. So these are amazing records of uh, climate spanning uh, millions of years, if not tens of millions of years back into the past. So I'm going back even further now, back to the Eocene times, which has been the main focus of my kind of research uh, to date. And I always like showing uh, this picture. Every time I look at it, it, it just amazes me. <clears throat> just to show how different the Eocene climate uh, and Eocene life was uh, to modern uh, conditions. So the tectonics of the Eocene, you know, is a recognizable world. It's not that dissimilar to, to modern. But this is a, a a set of fossils recovered or found in, in Panama from the latest Paleocene, so just before the Eocene Epoch, about 57, 58 million years old. And the fossil material, these are actually fossil vertebrae of the darker colored um, uh, vertebrae uh, that dominate uh, this slide here. Um, and just for comparison, uh, this little kind of whitish fossil vertebrae is a vertebrate from a, a 10 meter long, not a, 10, a three meter long modern anaconda snake. And these fossil vertebrae come from a similar uh, snake from the same kind of uh, family, these sort of boa constrictor type snakes. And it's been reconstructed as being somewhere between 13 and 15 meters long. And that's the reconstruction of it uh, down here. So this huge snake with this, I like to think of this alligator kind of creeping along in the background, trying to stay out of the way. So how come snakes can get so big in the Eocene? So we're in a tropical site, it's tropical now, it was tropical in the Eocene, but we think the much higher mean annual temperatures allow these cold-blooded organisms to grow uh, much, much uh, larger. So climate is clearly having an effect on the type of life and organism that can exist in the Eocene. Closer to home, and I was out uh, on the Isle of Sheppey a couple of weeks ago in half term. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything as nice as this. <clears throat> but this is a palm, uh, a palm fruit uh, from the Isle of Sheppey in the London clay. So this is an early Eocene, 50 million year old deposits uh, weathering out on the beach in Sheppey. And you find all sorts of lovely fossils uh, on, on the Isle of Sheppey coming out the London clay. So a palm tree uh, is not going to be growing on Sheppey unless it's very well protected or in a greenhouse. So clearly, uh, Sheppey was much, much warmer during the Eocene. And we've also got things like crocodiles and turtles and a, quite a lovely diverse uh, community of, of vertebrate um, uh, um, organisms uh, living on Sheppey that again are typically uh, found from tropical or subtropical environments today. So clearly the climate has changed significantly between the Eocene and the modern. Even more extreme, and I I'm going to show in the next few slides, just a couple of um, examples from the two polar regions, just to really hammer home how different 
uh, the Eocene climate was to modern. This is again work from the ocean drilling program. So this is an amazing expedition uh, up to the Arctic uh, back in, I think it was 2003. Um, the European Drilling Consortium uh, hired a Russian icebreaker ship, which is the ship you see in the distance here, which broke up the large kind of ice, sea ice uh, conditions um, uh, that you find in the Arctic to try and get up to the central Arctic where they wanted to drill. And then they had another, I think it was a, a Norwegian icebreaker kind of following that large nuclear powered uh, ship. And then they had a small Swedish vessel that was kind of ice capable, but not an icebreaker, on which was mounted a, a drilling rig actually from the British Geological Survey. And they used this rig to drill down into the ocean sediments beneath the Arctic. So these three ships were working constantly for two months. Um, the two icebreakers breaking up the ice so that this little drilling ship could cope with it. And the drilling ship drilling uh, as much of the time as it could uh, given some of the technical issues that they faced up there. But what they recovered from the central Arctic were these very dark organic rich uh, sediments from the Eocene uh, time period. So really amazing first time we've had any glimpse of what the Arctic was like back uh, millions or tens of millions of years ago. So really groundbreaking uh, studies. And <clears throat> When you hear people talking about this, this uh, expedition, the reconstructions of the Eocene Arctic, they kind of liken it a bit to the Black Sea. So a restricted basin, the gateways between sort of Greenland and Europe and Greenland and North America were, were largely closed at that time. So it's probably like a big freshwater lake. But what they found within those organic rich sediments are lots and lots of fern spores called, um, from a freshwater fern called Azola, which has relatives still living today. So this is indications that there, it was ice free, it was warm, it was certainly with a freshwater surface uh, to the Arctic. So in a way, you can think of it as a big kind of black sea, in a way covered, or at least some of the, the kind of large parts of it covered by this freshwater uh, fern. So very, very different uh, to the modern. Going to the South Pole, Again, drilling off, off Antarctica, so off the East Antarctic ice sheet, a place called Wilkes Land. Again, recovered Eocene sediments. And in those Eocene sediments, they found some uh, lovely pollen. And that pollen, a bit like the Isle of Sheppey, was again from, from palm trees. And this is the modern distribution of natural uh, palm trees and these yeah, yellow dots. Um, and in the Eocene, you're seeing them right up uh, to the Antarctic. So, Again, we're seeing subtropical conditions with maybe mean annual temperatures in the high teens, maybe even to the 20s on the margins of Antarctica. And Antarctica was pretty much in the same position as it was uh, today. So really very, very different uh, climates to modern. So that's, I introduced that because it's nice to see fossil evidence. It's much easier to sort of in a way comprehend uh, uh, seeing tropical <coughs> or subtropical organisms up in these, these very high latitude environments is a really clear demonstration uh, that temperatures were much, much warmer in the poles. We can also do the same with various geochemical data uh, where we try and uh, understand the geochemical proxies of, of mostly kind of marine carbonates, uh, remains of things like foraminifera that live out in the, the surface or the deep ocean or also from plant fossils on land. We can try and reconstruct temperature from, from uh, various types of, of what we call proxy data. So this is a, pro a climate proxy. We're analyzing the geological record to try and understand some component of ancient climate. So this is what we did in the run up to the last IPCC report, uh, a set of model data in the background uh, and proxy data in these little uh, circles. And what it's showing, it's not, absolute temperature. It's showing you the temperature anomaly between our pre-industrial climate and the Eocene. So it's saying how much warmer was the Eocene than uh, the modern world before we started messing around with it. So you can see on the left hand side, if you look at this, um, the temperatures in the oceans, you can see that the tropics were warmer, but maybe not, you know, five to eight degrees warmer, perhaps. But you see the massive warming in the polar regions, so up to 20, maybe even 30 degrees warmer than today. 
which is an effect called polar amplification, which we're kind of familiar with. As you lose ice sheets, uh, you tend to get much greater warming uh, in the poles than you do in the rest of the planet. Uh, so good, actually reasonably good agreement between the proxy data and the models. And just to, again, some of you might be familiar with this plot, but this is a beautiful new uh, paper that's out uh, last year. Um, Thomas Westerhold's work, it builds on the classic, what we call the Zakos curve. This is a record of oxygen isotope data from deep sea uh, benthic foraminifera, for those in the know. But if you don't want to know about the details, basically it's a record of climate. So what we see here is uh, millions of years before present. So on the right hand side is today. On the left hand side, far left is uh, the end Cretaceous. So the Cretaceous mass extinction. So we're talking about the time period of the Cenozoic from when the dinosaurs go extinct to the modern. And if the uh, line is um, uh, uh, towards the the vertical direction, if it's, it's uh, higher up, we see the, these higher temperatures, the temperature scales on the left-hand side, and also nicely color-coded with these kind of stripes. That's all the rage these days to have these, these climate stripes. So the darker the red, the warmer the climate, and then the darker the blue, the colder the climate. So you can see this lovely record of climate change. So if we look at the Eocene, we can really see that this, particularly the early part of the Eocene, um, is where we're seeing peak uh, temperatures for the whole uh, Cenozoic. So it's really the hottest uh, climate state uh, in the last sort of 65 million years or so. And then we start to cool uh, down towards the modern. Um, and we really think, you know, this is probably best estimates now about 14 degrees C warmer uh, than pre-industrial back in the Eocene. We've updated that uh, work for, um, for the most, uh, for the latest IPCC report with uh, actually adding much more um, data. So this is now all the sea surface temperature data and also looking at other intervals. That last plot was for the early Eocene. Now we've been targeting um, an event called the PETM, which I'll talk briefly about um, uh, a little bit later. So the PETM is a very transient warming event at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene. So right at the very start of the Eocene. We targeted the latest, most Paleocene just before that event. And we also target the early Eocene, this uh, so-called early Eocene climatic optimum, this eco uh, interval around 50 million years ago. Lots of sea surface temperature data. That's the, the scale on the left-hand side here. Uh, and it's plotted by uh, paleo latitude. So this is the equator, the zero paleo latitude in the middle. Um, as you go towards the right-hand side, you're going towards uh, the Northern hemisphere. So the ASEX, uh, data is actually from the Arctic coring that I just showed you. Uh, then we've got some data from, you know, the American um, continental margin, so the New Jersey margin. Then we go to tropical sites, and then we go down to these southern ocean sites over on the left-hand side here. And in the background here, this is the modern, uh, basically the modern climate. So this is the temperatures of the modern ocean, give you a sense of, of how modern ocean temperatures vary across a latitude. And really the thing to point out, like I just said, is that in the high latitudes, particularly in the Southern Ocean, we see this massive difference in temperatures between the modern, where it's down towards zero, and the Eocene, where we're reconstructing temperatures in the sort of mid to high 20s, if not even warmer. Um, so there's a really big change in, in these polar uh, climates. We can use that data. So again, this is the latest Paleocene. This is for the Paleocene Eocene boundary, the PCM, and the bottom image is for the early Eocene. So these are basically statistical smooths of the proxy data to try and show you the patterns of, of how uh, warming changed uh, spatially. You know, put a little bit of um, uh, a caveat on these that the data is quite sparse. So the smoothing as anyone who does geostatistics or geospatial analysis, you know, if you smooth between relatively few data points, you have to be uh, pretty tricky about the, the, the patterns it gives you. But really just to point out the main pattern is that uh, the polar regions warm a lot more than the tropics again. So this is again, the difference between pre-industrial and the Eocene. But again, we've got these high latitude temperatures up to sort of 20 or 30 degrees warmer than today. And if you compare that proxy data to the models, this is a, a US model, the um, 
National uh, NCAR, whatever that stands for, National Climate and Atmospheric Research Organization, I think it is. This is their model, CSM uh, model, one of the best models they have running at the moment to predict future climate change. So the background is the model uh, and the dots of the data. So we're actually now doing really well matching the climate models to the data, which wasn't the case 10 or 15 years ago. The models really struggled to predict these high latitude uh, warm climates. But if you look at those models, in order to get those very high temperatures of the ear seen, you need to drive them really hard with very high CO2 levels. So um, <clears throat> these are a number of different models. This is the one I just showed, CESM. There's a German GFDL model. There's the Hadley Center, Hadsim 3. Um, and I think this is the French one, IPSL. I think it's a French model. And basically the, the curves are the model sea surface temperature and dotted line is the surface air temperature compared to the proxy data. You can see they're all doing a pretty good job of matching the proxy data, but all of the models are, are being driven by CO2 concentrations uh, up towards 2000 parts per million, so sort of 1500 to 2000 parts per million. So really, really high uh, CO2 levels in order to, to match the temperatures that we see in the fossil record. So the question is, is that, are those CO2 levels uh, uh, realistic. And if you look, this is a paper we're involved in trying to bring together the proxy data with Chris Hollis and myself and about 30 other kind of authors. We looked at sea surface temperature data, surface air temperature data from terrestrial environments, but also CO2 data. So we try to compile uh, all of the available proxy data. And if you look at the CO2 data, this is one of the big target intervals we're looking at, the early ear scene. Uh, climate optimum. If you look at marine proxy data for CO2, um, we have nothing in the eco, or we did have nothing. Uh, and then there's some um, terrestrial based uh, estimates, mainly based on uh, paleosols or stomata. And you can see there's quite a big kind of spread in that terrestrial uh, data. There's another paper that came out in the same year, I think it was in geology, again looking at some terrestrial stomata data and other um, proxies. And so through this really peak early Eocene climate optimum, they're reconstructing CO2 levels to be around 600 parts per million. Okay, just think about that, that if in the Eocene, we've got temperatures, mean global surface temperatures that are 14 degrees higher than the pre-industrial at CO2 forcings of about five or 600 parts per million. So not far off kind of where we're headed um, pretty soon. You know, we're already in this kind of clipping some of these lower data points. So that is a really uh, scary thought. Uh, if levels of CO2 at that low can produce such great warming. But there is a big offset between those terrestrial based CO2 data and some of the data from the marine which puts CO2 much, much higher up in the thousand or over a thousand parts per million. So there's a sort of 900 parts per million degree, uh, parts per million offset between those two sets of data. So I'm just going to show you very quickly some new data that we've got from uh, a core off the Rockwell Trough, actually drilled by the Irish Petroleum Infrastructure Project back in the late 90s. Um, it's a really interesting core, so it's if anyone knows that part of the world, there was a big uplift in the latest Paleocene, early Eocene. A large part of that area was um, uplifted by a mantle swell, which I'll actually talk about in a little while. And then it's subsiding through the early Eocene. So we see uh, the recovery of the core, uh, relatively shallow core drilled down to about 140 meters depth. And they recovered about 40 meters of lovely green early Eocene clays, beautiful fossil preservation. Uh, and also preservation of uh, organic material, which is going to be important. And then there's nonconformity, and then it goes into Middle Eocene, basically carbonate, deep sea kind of ooze, um, which is also interesting and, and uh, useful. But really, it's these lovely early Eocene clays that we're kind of interested in, which has these lovely forearm preservation, um, beautiful kind of glassy, uh, almost modern-like preservation of carbonate. 
but it also has some lovely biomarkers. So these are uh, um, organic long chain molecules. Here I'm showing the concentration of a compound called uh, an alkanone, which is actually a fat that's produced by the cochlear four algae that I study. And alkanones are great because you can use them to look at, um, to try and reconstruct atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And if people are interested, I can show an extra couple of slides about that. So you can use these fats basically um, because they're produced by photosynthesis. The way that they fractionate carbon into the cells uh, is dependent on how much CO2 was in the atmosphere. So you can use them to reconstruct uh, CO2. And we did this for the site. This is the existing uh, reconstructions of um, actually the, the kind of isotopic fractionation into these algal uh, lipids. Um, and we had a record that went back to about 45 million years before, uh, but no earlier than that. And we've extended that with lots of data from this core, this early Eocene core in Rockwell, which is really useful. And you can see it fits on this trend of increasing fractionation of carbon isotopes. You don't need to worry about the details of that. I can I can go into it if people are interested. But we can turn those isotopic fractionation into reconstructions of CO2. So now the scale is uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. You can see rising up from hundreds of parts per million in the Oligocene up towards a thousand in the kind of late Eocene and uh, back to maybe over a thousand by the time you get back into the, the sort of early middle Eocene. And again, if we turn our, our new data into CO2, we're suddenly getting, getting values over a thousand parts per million uh, CO2 back in the Eocene. So, which is much more consistent with those model results and with other marine proxies, and really says that something's wrong with the stomata, I think, which is what many, many people suspect. So we can slightly relieve our panic that, you know, we do need to push CO2 really, really high uh, in order to get these very high temperatures back in the Eocene. And we can see this from a latest compilation using some of this data. Uh, this is a, a version of that long-term climate record that I showed earlier. So this is the, um, effectively you can think of, think of it as global temperature. So this is the warm ear scene up here towards the left on the top figure. And this is CO2 levels uh, at, the, at the bottom. So reconstructed CO2 levels. And again, you can see for the earlier scene now, we've got um, values up at around sort of 1,500 to 2,000 parts per million. So things are actually looking much more consistent now uh, with these new records between CO2 and temperature change. But I'm going to ask a question now, look, how did CO2 get so high? Why was CO2 going up, particularly through the late Paleocene into the early Eocene? We can see this rise in temperature up to this, this early Eocene peak, and we see a rise in CO2 as well. You also might notice this spike, both in the temperature record and in the CO2 record at this Paleocene-Eocene boundary. And that's this event that we call the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. It's a short-lived, it's about 150,000 years long, transient warming event of maybe five degrees C. So it's already warm, and then you get an extra warming pulse on that background um, warm climate, and a, a, a spike in CO2 as well. And maybe that's contributing to this, this longer-term uh, warming as well. And the cause of this warming event has been much debated over many years. Some people have pointed towards gas hydrates, so methane hydrates that are stored uh, under the ocean. So on continental margins, there's lots of methane hydrates in the modern system. And maybe uh, in, the, in the Eocene, that became unstable and could be released. But we don't really expect there to be that much methane hydrate around at this time because the oceans were so much, much warmer. And also the amount of CO2 that's released at the PTM seems to be much, much, much larger uh, even than modern uh, reserves of methane hydrate. So really it's been a puzzle as to what could release so much CO2 to the atmosphere, maybe doubling CO2 within maybe 5,000 years. Um, what could be the source of that CO2 and, could, and how could it be released so quickly? Well, Somebody we've been pointing to the deep earth, and there are interesting things going on in tectonics at that time. There's the starting of the Indian Asian uh, collision and subduction zones going on uh, around that collision zone. But more locally, and more importantly, uh, for those who've traveled to Northwest Scotland, to Ireland, or if you're lucky to, to Greenland, uh, 
you would know that a lot of the geology in those areas is dominated by volcanic and intrusive uh, uh, rocks of uh, Paleocene or Eocene age. So this is the Giant's Causeway with me on it on the right hand side down in, in Northern Ireland. Parts of these kind of Paleocene and earliest Eocene volcanics and intrusive uh, 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 systems. So could this um, big set of eruptions, what we call the North Atlantic Igneous Province, could they have anything to do with uh, the PETM and this release of CO2? Well, it was always very, very difficult to work out volumes of magmatism, to work out rates of magmatism. Um, but this is a paper we published a couple of years ago in Nature Communications, really work of Steve Jones, who's worked in this area, he's a geophysicist, worked in this area for a long time, and really been interested in this, basically the onset of this mantle plume, which is now uh, the sort of remnant of that is now under Iceland causing this hotspot but much, much more significant uh, uh, mantle plume in the late Paleocene, early Eocene, Eocene. And really when it got, got first started, this plume head um, really drove a lot of this igneous activity. And Steve, he did great work using a lot of geophysical surveys to map out all of the intrusive rocks he could in, in various areas on the UK uh, and Norwegian and Greenland continental margins, looked at the kind of distribution of um, uh, sill depths, mainly looking at uh, uh, igneous sills, mainly on the continental margin, so in sediments below the seabed, looking at size, depth, um, the rocks that they were intruding into. So it had a really good sense of, of what the distribution of these sills were. Um, if you look at each sill, you can actually, there are good models for when a, a sill of any particular size intrudes into sediments, if we know the organic carbon content in those sediments, you can work out how much each sill will effectively cook those surrounding sediments um, and release thermogenic uh, methane. So it, it cooks the organic material within those sediments, releases methane and CO2. So we can model how much each sill would release. But what we really want to know is, okay, how quickly were all these sills uh, in place? And how quickly did this volcanic activity happen? And this is the neat bit that still, uh, Steve has been looking at for a long time, it's, it's records of uplift caused by this plume. And you can look at uplift records from across uh, the UK, and you can actually trace how this plume impacted, caused uplift and spread, uh, looking at really at seismic data and seismic erosion patterns on, on seismic data. And you can put all this together into this model I'm just about to show. So what you're seeing here, uh, each little red dot is a uh, emplacement of a sill in this area as this plume in, impinges and spreads out. Uh, and as the red dot decays away, the intensity of the redness is, is its release of carbon. So when the sill is intruded, it's very hot, it releases a lot of carbon. And then as it cools, that carbon release uh, fades away. So we now actually you can see in the top left hand corner, there's a, a time tracer. So because of this uplift, uh, patterns that we know how it, these plumes spread out in time. We can now actually start modeling emissions of CO2 and methane uh, in time uh, at the PTM. We know this event was very, very close to the, the, the PETM uh, climate event. So we can add up all of those carbon emissions from each of those individual sills. And what we get is uh, emissions rates here. This is in petagrams of carbon per year. And that's this blue curve, sorry, red curve uh, going on in the background here. So it's the Monte Carlo simulation using all of those, those sills. Um, and what is really neat about this, the best estimates from climate records, so looking at chemistry change in the ocean of carbon emission rates um, that drive changes in ocean chemistry, such as ocean, ocean acidification, are shown in this blue curve. So we, for the first time, this is a geologically feasible uh, mechanism. Oh, oh, I got too excited. A geologically feasible mechanism um, for release of carbon that could be driving this Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum event with really good matches between what we see in the oceans, so the actual effect of the CO2 release uh, and a potential source from this, this igneous intrusive uh, activity. So maybe local geology actually here, relatively local to us, is causing this, this very rapid, significant global warming event and perhaps also contributing to these high CO2 levels uh, in the Eocene. 
So just for the last five minutes or so, this is that I've really focused on the early Eocene, so these very, very warm climate uh, states. I just want to briefly look at some uh, new data. Uh, actually, where I started off my kind of research career was looking at the end of the Eocene. So at the end of the Eocene, we see a very dramatic shift in climates. Uh, and almost certainly it's associated with the growth of this amazing uh, ice sheet on Antarctica. So this is a great reconstruction showing how uh, the Antarctic ice sheets actually flow and move. These are reconstructions of ice streams. So showing the, the big East Antarctic ice sheets uh, and uh, where you see these, these very purplish colors, this is the major drainage basin to the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, how the ice sheet actually flows and moves and then drains away to the, these basins at, at the sides of the, the continent. But I'm really interested, okay, how do we get cold enough at the end of the Eocene for this ice sheet uh, to grow? So we're looking at this time now here between the Eocene and the Oligocene about 34 million years ago. And in this climate record, you can really see this event as a very sharp uh, step change uh, in climate. So we go from these uh, orangey colours into these bluey colours uh, as the, the global climate uh, cools and we form this Antarctic ice sheet. Now, back in when I was just sort of uh, starting my PhD, this uh, paper was all the rage. It's a, a model of how you can grow an Antarctic ice sheet uh, just by gradually declining CO2 levels. Uh, eventually, ice becomes stable in some of the high mountainous areas of Antarctica. So we see ice sheet growth in these high mountains areas, particularly along the Gombertsev mountains that separate East and West Antarctica. And then these ice sheets uh, spread out. And what's neat about them is when they join up with each other, they buffer each other. So there's strong feedbacks that when they coalesce, uh, they become much more stable. Uh, so there's a kind of internal ice sheet dynamic uh, um, uh, or the, the ice sheet dynamics contribute to the dynamics of this climate uh, transition. And that's shown here on the left hand side as well. This is just um, a kind of plot through time, or you can think of it as declining CO2. And what you see is going from left to right is ice sheet volume. So on the left, there's almost no ice. On the right, there's lots of ice. And what you see is these characteristics, even though the forcing this gradually declining CO2 is just a gradual change. We see step changes in the amount of ice on Antarctica because of this buffering effect. And the model shows that there should be a couple of major steps uh, in this ice sheet growth. And what's super exciting is that when uh, new records from the deep ocean came of this transition, and particularly like, you know, records such as these on the left, this is uh, a drilling program that I was involved with so we're out in the eastern equatorial Pacific back in 2009. The transition between the Eocene and the Oligocene is this shift from very dark colored sediments to light colored sediments, so carbonate rich sediments. And if you look at this carbonate content in detail, so over the right hand side here, this is lots of uh, these sites in this particular area. In most of them, we see this characteristic two step change in the amount of carbonate that we think is closely coupled to the climate transition. So it's an amazing case of models suggesting a, a particular dynamic and then actually it's going out and finding uh, that dynamic uh, actually in uh, in the oceans. So this was uh, work that's you know first recognized this two-step shift soon after the model results but this is a new set of um, data that we're just about to submit working with people at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton with really the the best compilation of, of data through this transition that we have uh, to date, uh, isotope data and uh, carbonate data. And from this data, we can actually reconstruct the sort of chemistry of the oceans. So now we're going, I'm very going from right old to left young. And really just to focus on uh, this black curve here, which is really telling us about um, carbonate concentrations in the ocean. So um, if it, this curve is upwards, then it suggests that the oceans are more acidic, if you like, uh, that carbonate is less saturated in the oceans. And if it's down here on the left-hand side, uh, that carbonate saturation in the oceans is much higher. 
So we think this transition from uh, low saturation to high saturation state is probably to do with um, the loss of carbonate burial in things like coral reefs, shallow shelf carbonates. Um, as you drop sea level, because you're forming ice on Antarctica, we're losing that carbonate burial on the shelves. All of that carbonate then has to go into the deep ocean. So the deep oceans become more carbonate saturated. So we've known about that for a while, but what's interesting is just before this event, we have this distinct low carbonate saturation interval just before the transition. And we've got some interesting ideas. We've got a paper, it's in review. It's, we're sitting with the editor now at the moment with, in Nature Comms. We're not sure what the reviews are saying, uh, but data from the US Gulf Coast. There's a PhD student of mine who worked on this, this core extensively for his PhD. It's just near Jackson, Mississippi. What's nice about it is just on the um, outflow of the Paleo Mississippi River. It's a shallow marine sediment core, but it's really picking up what's coming out of the, the ancient Mississippi uh, River. This is it's quite a busy diagram, I'm afraid. So again, we're going age um, from the bottom of the diagram up through the late Eocene into the Oligocene. But what's neat, just before uh, this Eocene Oligocene boundary, when we're seeing the ice sheets, what we're seeing in this Mississippi uh, outflow region is a real peak in things like plants, material, uh, a peak in terrestrial uh, sediments, um, a loss of marine uh, flora and fauna, um, and also these very distinctive negative isotope shifts in carbon and oxygen that we think are indicative of, of basically Mississippi outflow waters. So we think there's really strong evidence, this increase in terrestrial matter, loss of marine matter, increasing the influence of the ice topic signature of the, the Paleo uh, Mississippi River, really good evidence for sea level fall. And we think it's an early sign of sea level fall, but it's actually causing the erosion of lots of organic matter out into the deep ocean. And we put this together in, into model. Think about as you start to, to form ice on Antarctica, you're starting to drop sea levels. Um, lots of the Eocene uh, coastal regions have, have experienced high sea levels, tropical climate conditions for a very long time, and they're probably very, very organic carbon rich. So we think as we, you start to drop sea level, you're suddenly eroding a lot of this organic carbon out of these coastal environments into the deep ocean. And we're suggesting that that is causing this uh, low carbonate uh, saturation state in the deep ocean this acidification of the ocean, if you like, early on in this transition. And in a way it might act, this, this release of organic carbon might actually act as a bit of a break on the development of Antarctic ice sheets. That's our argument uh, and suggestion. So really interesting coupling of thinking about how uh, um, sea level, um, how our shallow seas, uh, how they behave when we start growing ice sheets as substantial as Antarctica for the first time for you know hundreds yeah probably over 100 million years more um, uh, and the dynamics of the carbon cycle that were associated with that so maybe we've gone on five minutes longer than uh, th than planned but hopefully still leave uh, 10 minutes for questions I really just like to finish with this quote uh, this was from a uh, an exhibition we did at the Lapworth Museum but it's been used by many others just pointing out that we know more about the surface of the moon because of um, satellite observations and we can actually see the surface than we do about the surface of our own planet because most of it, two thirds of it is covered by, by the oceans. And we really know uh, quite little about our, our deep ocean uh, environment. I, quite, I like that quote, uh, when you're thinking about our planets and the oceans and ocean exploration. Phew, I'm gonna stop there. Hope you're all still on the call and uh, uh, have some questions. <laughs>